Hey guys, welcome to part two of my Let's Play series on the Sforza campaign for Age of Empires II Definitive Edition. As always, I go by Philadelphia, and as the designer of the Sforza campaign, as well as a few other campaigns featured in Age of Empires II Definitive Edition, you get a little something different with this Let's Play in that you get to see a Let's Play done by the actual scenario's designer. So I talk about some of the gameplay choices, design choices, some of the history behind the scenario, and so forth. So let's get right into it here. Now last time I described Sporza as almost like a Renaissance Han Solo. Now that's not the most perfect analogy, there are definitely differences, but there are some similarities that I highlighted in the last video. So if you haven't checked the last video out, check that out. You can kind of explain what I was thinking about there, as well as you get to see the let's play of the first scenario, Mercenaries and Masters. Now, when we last left off in Sporza's story, he had just finished defeating the Venetians at the Battle of Brescia, but unfortunately, the very suspicious and jealous Duke of Milan, Filippo Visconti, decided to execute Sforza. Now, Sforza got wind of this and was very bold and shows up to the courts of Milan. And the Duke of Milan is so impressed with Sforza's boldness that he not only forgives Sforza, but actually betrothes his own daughter to Sforza, making Sforza the heir apparent to the Dukedom of Milan. Now, as we go into the next scenario, it's called His Own Man. I'm actually going to change the difficulty. Now, we, we completed this the first scenario on hard. I'm actually going to drop it down to moderate. Now, that's not to say I couldn't complete the scenario on hard. The concern I have is just because I want to focus on talking some of the history, some of the design choices, I realized in some you know test videos that playing on hard was a little bit too difficult for me to do that. I had to pay attention to the scenario, so I wasn't able to talk about things. I'm hoping playing on moderate make it a little easier so I can actually talk to um, different things that happen in the scenario. So let's dive right into it now. After the wars with Venice, Visconti made sure he got his gold's worth out of us. He sent Sforza south to enforce the Duke's claims in Romagna. I think the Duke was having second thoughts about Sforza. After we left, Piccinino and his men followed us. Sforza could see through the plot. Although he was betrothed to the Duke's daughter, he knew Visconti was fickle. He also knew that being a landless condottiero was a risky proposition. Sforza needed to be his own man and have his own land. A refuge if the machinations of his employers turned against him, or if they demanded justice for Sforza's own treachery. What better opportunity than to use Visconti's weapons and money to his own benefit by making himself the ruler of a city? What better opportunity indeed. And as we talked about in the first scenario, these Canatieri, like Francisco Sforza, could be very conniving, very cunning. They were in it for their own gain, their own money. And they often betrayed their employers and sometimes had aspirations of their own. So here we go right into it here. The, the first main objective is to destroy Piccinino's military buildings. You may remember from the first scenario, Piccinino was our ally. Now he's our enemy. Um, our secondary objective here is to bring the relic to monasteries to capture cities. And we'll talk about that as we play the scenario. You can see the hints here. Feel free to pause the video if you want to go through and read these hints, as well as the scout section here. One thing I do want to point out in the hints, though, is that there are many unemployed mercenaries waiting to be hired in the villages um, of the south and along the coast. And so we'll see one of these other young mercenaries, Sigismondo Malatesta, during the course of the scenario. Sforza, you took Ancona for your own with the Duke's money and arms. He has sent me to bring you to justice. Ah, so here we say we just took the city here in Kona, and now Piccinino has been sent to stop us. And so we have to defeat Piccinino him. Piccinino well. stalks us like a wolf, but the hungry dog I fights right. harder. Bring the relic of San Ciriaco to the churches, and the cities will join us. In Boca Alupo, cousin. So just like the previous scenario, because this the Sforza campaign, you're playing as a condottiero, you're playing as a mercenary. Again, you don't have an economy here. Um, the we captured the city, but we're not going to get, we're not, you know, worrying about, we're sports. We're not worrying about ca gathering wood and farming and stuff like that. We just want to get paid, right? And here, we're going to go capture each of these cities. These are actually Italian cities here. And we can capture them by bringing this relic to the monasteries. And once we capture them, the buildings turn to our control. We can train units from them, do upgrades, so forth. We actually will start advancing in age and we start getting regular payments of resources. Um, again, our main objective is to destroy Piccinino's military buildings. He does have a few bases. You can actually accomplish that without taking these cities. Cousin, there are many the more... unemployed contotieri seeking patrons. 
We should find and recruit them. I have heard Sigismondo Malatesta is among them. He would make a great ally. I was saying the more these cities you capture, the more resources you get, and so easier the objective comes. Uh, Machaletto, our cousin here, actually points out that there is a mercenary captain named Sigismondo Malatesta who we can recruit over the course scenario. Now I'm going to try to take this first city here, and there's a couple ways you can approach it here, even on, on moderate. I'm going to do something you can do even on hard. I'm going to take this transport ship with the relic, and I'm going to try to backdoor into the city and drop it off. Now, to help me out, I'm going to actually use a siege tower. Siege towers are useful for some things. Even if they're not crossing the wall here, it will be useful to uh, draw some of the enemy troops out of the city. Because the thing is here, the city has quite a few arbalesters here. But there's actually a back entrance. And as long as I get the relic into this monastery, I can take this entire city. Um, so I'm going to plan to lure away some of these arbalests here, away from the dock area, which is over here. And once I move these forces out, I can then easily drop off the monast drop off the monk and the relic into the monastery. So I'm going to bring the sea shower closer, but also try to do the same time putting the transport ship in. I'm try to lure some of these arbalesters away. Again, high pierce armor here, they can take a lot of shots. Very quickly here, drop off the condos first. So they can draw away some of the fire, and then drop off the monk. And very simply, has just inspired this town to join us. We will now begin the receiving bread, lumber, and gold from the townsfolk. Okay, and so now I'm starting to get some resources straight up. I'll get, uh, you can see a continuous increase of resources. I'm a holy man canvassing around with a saint's relic. I know who you truly are, Sforza. Okay, I'm also going to drop off this relic here to get resources. And now there's a bunch of different, you saw these kind of tearing out from Tomer Control. There are a bunch of different, uh, let's say, free mercenary companies that I can quickly recruit. So I know there's a few down here, so I'm going to send my knight, or my cavalier, excuse me, down there to recruit them. And at this point, my next goal is to take this next city. Similar game plan. Now here, it's a little harder to get into their back door because they have seawall. So I'm going to take a more direct approach. And to do that, I'm going to have to train units, which means I'm going to have to accumulate some resources and build some armies so I can actually do that. So I'm going to bring my forces over here. Back here, and I, I'm going to play this thematically like I did with the first scenario. I'm going to be kind of true to the Italians, and so get upgrades that favor um, the Italian civilization's playstyle. Lots of archers, hand cannoneers, kind of tiered, and so forth. So I'm going to try to get some of these um, first archer upgrades as well as the infantry upgrades. And as the resources come in, I'm going to start training some units. Now I do have to tear down this gate here. I don't yet have a siege workshop, so again, that's fine. I can use units. Actually, I might be able to even find a siege weapon somewhere out here, if I can continue searching through the autumn, the Italian autumn here. And I'm gonna get some of these upgrades, I think. I think I'm gonna go, I'd be crossbowmen first and train a couple archers. He's under attack. So Piccinino has a base here. Oh, hang can here, causing some problems. Here, I got some more condos. Oh, and here's the battering ram. Let those guys fight. Let these guys in the battering ram, it's in the captain ram actually. And bring this up here, I'll, I'll use that. And it looks like I'm going to lose all those forces. So Pichinino does have a pretty strong military presence here. He also has military presence um, up in this area as well. As well as a big city to the west. Slowly bring this battering ram up. So again, because I'm getting resources based on how many cities I own, I can increase that resource amount by taking the next city um, as soon as possible. But I do want to make sure I have a pretty strong force to do that first. We get forging, get mail armor. Um, again, these upgrades won't affect the units I picked up. It's just a feature of Age of Empires. It's been, it's been the case since the first Age of Empires. Um, but that's fine. I do have the battering ram to draw some of the fire, to take down that gate, and so forth. I would like to explore to go find Sigismundo Malatesta. He's located up here, but they actually, uh, Piccinino does have a pretty strong uh, naval presence, so I don't think one ship is going to be sufficient to do that. So I'm going to wait a little longer. Um, continue training some units. I think at this point, I see a light cavalry. I might go train the scout cavalry just to kind of see what kind of units they have over there. And I want to talk a little bit more about the history as well and some of the design choices for this scenario. Now, 
Again, you might notice um, between this scenario and the first scenario, um, they are not traditional build and destroy. There's no real economy here. Instead, your economy is these payments, and you do certain things to get the payments. In this case, capture cities. So I want to kind of have that um, over the course of the first few scenarios when Sforza doesn't really have his own territory. He's completely just an empl um, being employed by a duke and so forth. Um, but you'll see quickly, um, as the story progresses, he starts getting his own little fiefdom, and so the there's a natural progression over the course of the campaign towards a more traditional building destroyed model. So I'm going to bring this scout cover up here. I just want to kind of see what kind of a units they have here. The towers, they have some more cavalry. I think spearmen might be helpful um, to use. So I think I'm going to go ahead and train a couple spearmen and get the upgrade for pikes. Actually, be smart, I should probably get the, re the pike upgrade over here. This pine lost him. I'm going to get ready to Hi. attack. I'm correct. Press okay. I still got a kind of Thierry on here. Now, one thing I do want to talk about is kind of Thierry in general. I kind of touched on them before, how their history. Um, a lot of people don't realize is that they weren't originally Italian. They were foreign mercenary troops, and then over time, the Italians um, started doing the same thing as well. Um, they really innovated um, European uh, combat during this time period because they actually cared about things like logistics. You know, you look at things like the Battle of Agincourt, where you know French knights just charge across a muddy field straight into longbow fire from the English. Um, that was kind of how warfare, European warfare, was for much of the Middle Ages. It was all about you know personal valor of individuals, knights, and there wasn't quite the organization. Um, instead, things like the Conatieri were professional soldiers. They operated like a unit. And in some ways, it was a throwback to the old Roman legions. Um, a lot of the Conatieri were educated and they were aware of some of the you know, military manuals and doctrine that was written back in Roman times. And they wanted to adopt some of those ideas. So you start seeing you know, the use of formations, you know, more unit tactics, drill, very deliberate drill of drilling different movements that you'll do in combat. Um, in addition, there was a big emphasis on things like logistics and protecting your supply lines and stuff like that. Things that, frankly, um, a lot of European uh, militaries prior to um, didn't really have much of a focus on. And so it, you saw this big change that really has trickled down to today um, out of some of this condottieri combat that men like Sporza participated in. So I want to take this force here. Fine. Strong enough. I'm going to use a batter ram primarily, batter this, use my archer base force and pikemen to deal with any enemies, and of course bring my monk. Might be actually good to train one more monk. I'm going to go ahead and just do that. And the monk is going to drop off the relics. So you'll see this repeatedly here. I'm going to focus on the objective. I'm not going to try to kill every unit here. It's counterintuitive. Um, instead, I'm going to try to destroy enough and kill enough that I can drop off the relic as fast as possible and then um, take the city under my control. So go ahead, target the ram here, keep these guys a little bit back, and monk a little closer, and we're going to go try to take this city here. The city, um, which, if you wonder where this scenario is taking place, is actually in a region of Italy called the Romagnol, or the Romagna. It's in northeastern Italy, um, it's along the Adriatic coast, and these are actually cities there. So, for example, Ravenna is here, and that was... For those that know history, Ravenna was briefly um, the capital of the Western Roman Empire um, toward the later stages. Now, just as I predicted, they're coming out. Actually, Piccinino has some troops with them as well. They're trying to take out my ram. I'm using my pikemen to deal with their cavalry. They have some commentary, which my, uh, my crossbowmen and arbalesters can handle pretty well. Continue bringing my battery ram closer. Try to just deal with these units. Yes, I'm killing probably these, a lot of these military units. That's fine. I just want to focus on taking... Um, the monastery here. So we kind of keep them back. We have so many monks heal. And just have this monk here ready to rush in as fast as he possibly can and drop it off. I should worry. It would be wise to also get the hit point upgrade and the speed upgrade as well for the monks to make this process a little easier. Taking some damage, so I'm going to keep having the monk heal. Pretty straightforward. Battering Ram is doing his job. Pichinino is exploring around with this. A couple of this condo here, that's fine, I'm not too worried about that. And now with this is down, I'm not too worried about anything else. I do want to watch out for this guy. He may kill my monk. I just want to worry, make sure his units don't kill my monk as he runs in here and he tries to drop off the relic. And hopefully not take any damage. And 
Oh, my monk is killed. Well, good thing I do have a second monk here. I do have to watch out for this. So, I'm gonna bring my battering ram out. Oh, no. Bring battering ram to draw the fire of the castle. And have my monk, who's already in my disc. Go pick up this relic. Okay, I know I'm losing men, but that's fine. I just want to do the objective as well as possible. Drop it off. And just like that, everybody flips to my control. A little, a little crazy, but now we've taken the city over a mini. Again, Pichinino, he's sending some troops here. I, I captured some of the condottieri camp here. A bit of a battle happening here. I have the, I have the towers, fortunately. Bring everybody in. Come back into the city here. Okay, and so now I'm, I've been to the Imperial Lake, got some more resources, have a castle, have a siege workshop, so I'm in a lot better position than I was um, earlier. And at this point, you know, this is one of those scenarios that, yes, Pichinino, he will train units, um, so he will get stronger, he will launch periodic attacks, but I have a pretty well fortified area here. I have towers, I have a gate, I have a castle. So I can kind of dig in a little bit here um, and concentrate on getting my upgrades. Um, as I talked about, and just focusing on, on that. Um, I should get conscription as well. Um, I will, Pichinino will have a navy here, so I do want to train some fire ships. So primarily his galleys, so I'm going to train some fire galleys. Um, both, both docks, and then use one of my other docks to actually get the upgrade so I can have fire ships instead of fire galleys. And at this point, I think I'm going to focus in on defeating Pichinino here and finding Malatesta. So I can recruit his forces and then use Malatesta's forces to kind of backdoor into Ravenna and then take this city. And then once I have enough resources and enough military, I'll then start sweeping through destroy Pichinino here as well as destroy Pichinino here in this city. So that's kind of my game plan here. I'm going to use my monk um, to heal. I'm going to go to um, try training another monk so I can speed up the healing as well as provide me, you know, in case I lose another monk, I can uh, still drop off the relic. And so, to kind of continue what we're talking about with Kanatieri is one thing about um, obviously in the game, uh, Kanatieri, uh, the Kanatieri unit is an infantry unit. It's a fast-moving infantry unit that's primarily anti-gunpowder. I mean, historically, that's not probably very accurate. Um, the unit design was more just to have something, you know, for game reasons and be interesting kind of unit. And truly, the Kanatieri unit in the game is a very interesting unit and does serve a very important role. You know, the fact that it's also a mercenary unit that, you know, your allies can recruit really does speak to the fact of the history of the Kanatieri. But as far as him being a foot soldier, that's a little probably different from history. Um, for the most part, most Kanatieri, like Sforza, were men-at-arms. And what they actually meant in the Middle Ages was men-at-arms were usually mounted soldiers. And yes, sometimes they would dismount, depending you know, on terrain or if they're in the woodlands or something like that, they would dismount and fight as infantry. But for the most part, they used uh, horses. And in fact, the unit of Kanatieri, they usually operated in teams of three um, with a the main Kanatieri, the horseman, the men-at-arms, a squire, and then an additional attendant. Um, so they often operated almost, you could say, like a fire team in modern military parlance that worked together. Um, the attendant and the squire also could fight as well. Um, and they were primarily mounted soldiers. Um, typically, they were armed with plate mail, with plate armor, I should say. Um, if you ever gone to, let's say, an art museum and you've seen um, some of the exhibits, uh, the arms and armor exhibits, where you see these, you know, very well armored, plate armored knights. You know, their horses are fully armored. They have, you know, they look like they're encased like a tank. Um, that's really what Condottieri kind of wore. It was more like what you might expect to see in like a jousting tournament. Because the fact of the matter is, that these guys were they wanted to make sure that they were protected i mean if you're a commentary you get severely wounded now that affects your income because you're not able to get a contract you're not able to fight anymore and so they wanted to they're very cautious they wanted to be fully armored fully equipped um typically they fought with lances not with swords um though they would obviously have like a side sword as an additional weapon but they primarily fought with lances and they did you know couch lances lance charges um against each other against you know soldiers so forth. So, actually, here I got a pretty strong naval force. I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of attack, move it straight up here, and start targeting some of these um, Pichinino's war galleys here. And again, I'm just gonna continue healing up my units, kind of sitting back, adding resources. Um, I'll probably train a couple more arbalesters. 
I'm gonna run in here because these hand cannons are in trouble. I'll probably just send my condos to hunt those guys down. I'll select them here. Send my condos, mass condos, to take out these two hand cannoneers here. I'm gonna just keep training Arbalesters. Again, something you don't want to see here is my fire galleys, or fire ships, excuse me, then separated. I want them to concentrate their fire to be pushing those navy. Now, he is training more units here, so I do want to eventually get these docks, but I want to take out these ones that are kind of harassing my own. Here. While I'm here, I'm going to see if I can find Pichinino. I mean, Melatesta, since he's in the middle of Melatesta, and recruit his forces. He will provide me with some more units. Your army is worthy of a king, Francesco. Nothing will stand in the way of the Atandolo peasants. It is an honor to fight with you. It is a pleasure to fight alongside a man like Francesco Sforza. May this alliance between two men of honor be long lived. There you go, just found Sigismundo Malatesta, who was a very famous condottieri captain. Um, oh, already my condottieri are being pretty aggressive. They're already destroying a lot of things here. I'm going to take out this barracks here just so we can't train units from it, and then take out this tower because it would make my ships. My ships are vulnerable to this tower. And have the ships concentrate on defeating these enemy ships. Looks like this camp will fall pretty quickly. Again, I'm playing on moderate, so this is not too hard. Um, but it does allow me to still talk to you guys while uh, playing. So that's always a benefit. So actually taking Pichinio's camp here a little bit quicker than I actually anticipated. Looks like they did have enough forces here. Again, playing on moderate is probably a easier. Um, probably bring my monk along. And I'm going to, to be efficient, I'm start training some kind of Uh, low on gold, so I might have to also train... Get the light cavalry upgrade, throw a couple light cavalry on there, like talk about, you know, kind of theory we're off in cavalry anyway. Got achieve. So, I don't have to worry about these tents actually. So, when it comes around the military bones, we took out the docks pretty straightforward. We don't actually need these ships anymore, I don't think. I got this force here from Sigma Sumondo Malatesta, and there's actually a back door into Ravina, so I'm gonna start moving these units towards that. I still need to get the, mo the monk with the relic in there. I'm gonna train a couple more monks. I'm gonna train one with resources. We're taking this out pretty cleanly. Okay. The one thing I've seen comments about when people talking about the Sforza campaign is the fact that I used the Portuguese civilization um, for a couple of different factions, primarily the Venetians. Now that does seem a little odd, but it actually makes some sense. Um, one thing about these campaigns is we try at Forgotten Empire simply to um, have campaigns that would provide the most diverse enemy types, just because it gets tiring playing against the same factions over and over again, and so you kind of want to um, have different experiences, experience more of the game, play against more of the factions, and so forth. Um, but the challenge is always that some of the historical events just don't work like that. And so obviously, you know, Sforza campaign, the entire campaign is set in Italy during a very specific time period in the 15th century. And so if I were to play this, you know, design this campaign true to life, um, you would have been Italians playing only against other Italian factions. And to be honest, that gets kind of repetitive. It's always, you know, Condottieri and, and Genoese crossbow men and Arbalesters and hand And it's like the same thing over and over again. And so... To kind of spice that up, I looked and saw, well, what other civs could I use? And actually, the Portuguese felt like a really good um, additional civ that still felt a little Italian. Obviously, they have the same um, building set, um, but there's also the fact that they have some of the similar types of units, like gunpowder focus that really fits the, the 1400s. And specifically, because one of the opponents is Venice, uh, Portugal actually makes a good proxy for that because the Venetians obviously were such a maritime force. And so having the Portuguese themselves a very naval-based civ um, made a lot of sense for that. So that kind of explains, you know, why you'll see later on in this campaign uh, the, Ven the Venetians are represented by the Portuguese. It provides gameplay diversity as well as kind of actually fits thematically to the Venetians relative to the other civs that are available um, in Age of Empires through the Finland edition. So I'm going to start moving south here. Um, yeah, I, I said I was going to try and concentrate and take Ravenna first. I may still do that because I can actually sneak my guys in. Oh, I, 
the controls, that's fine. We have a castle here. I'm just trying to take out some of these units here. I'm even more than back here so I can get into the range of my range units here. I have more test things. Fighting again, I just need to inflict enough casualties to the Ravina player that I can then get in and so that I can then bring my units in. And actually, very aggressive kind of TRE are actually being very bold here and taking out most of this force. So, I'm gonna just let them do that. I'm gonna get drawn into a distant battle here. I'm going to use the forces I have here to just kill their enemies and take their, destroy their buildings over here, destroy this camp. While simultaneously fighting here and taking out some of these, their units here. I have a force here. The relic's still there. I do want to get another monk. Another monk. Give me some more condos. And I want to then drop off the relic there while clearing out this base. So that hopefully simultaneously I'm in a position where I can then defeat the chain over here. Over there to the west, and then in this scenario. Again, because I'm playing a moderate, it's not too hard, um, but it, like I said, it does allow me to talk about some of the history. So, again, very straightforward scenario. Now, one thing um, that we often get kind of complaints is that people don't like sometimes when your enemies don't have economy, and as you can see here in this scenario, um, Kitchen, you know, doesn't have an economy, doesn't have a bunch of like villagers gathering resources. Instead, he has a fixed amount of resources, um, receives periodic resources over time, allows him to train units and so forth. So that was just a design choice because it's a simplified scenario. But one of the things that people may not realize is when you have the yeah, have a lot of villagers, it actually makes it difficult to modulate the difficulty because um, sometimes they may end up accumulating a ton of resources because the player isn't raiding their economy and it makes the scenario especially hard. That's really true for very novice players. So sometimes novice players can really struggle because they're not being aggressive attacking the AI's economy. And so the AI ends up having like 40, 50 villagers and they end up basically steamrolling the novice player. Whereas in the same scenario, an expert player may take out the economy, really hamstrung the AI, and then find the scenario being super easy, even though it really just depends on how you approach the scenario. The benefit of having it be um, the AI having fixed resources that, you know, cheating basically is that you can kind of control that. I can control in difficulty how many resources I'm going to fight the player. In fact, I can even modulate that in the scenario in terms of if the player is doing certain things, I can scale it back down. If the player is struggling, I can also scale it back down and make things a little easier dynamically. So there's a lot more options you can do with that. In addition, for some of these maps, we put so much care into you know designing these maps, putting every tree in and every bush. And to be honest, um, it's bad enough that the player actually has to you know chop down trees and destroy some of those scenes. But it becomes such a problem with the AI does it. Um, you never like to see something where you have this beautifully crafted city, enemy city, and you end up taking the enemy city and it just looks like barren. You know, there's tree stumps everywhere. All the resources have been taken. It doesn't look good. And so. All that work that went into the scenario, into that design of the how it looks, the player ends up not experiencing it. Um, and so that's another point of why often we'll have these scenarios where the AI doesn't have an economy. But generally speaking, that in my personal preference, something I prefer not to do. And so you'll see later in the subsequent scenarios in this campaign, the AI enemies will have an actual economy. They will be sending their villagers out. They're not actually cheating. Even on hard, some of them are not cheating. Um, and so that that is kind of like a preferred thing to to do but those scenarios are designed in such a way that they were built up from the ground up to do that and this scenario is one where the best course of action in terms of design choices i felt was to minimize uh the ai having an economy and said just receive payments like much like you do in this scenario as well so you're at least on equal footing there so i'm going to take this relic here i want to then drop it off here successfully defeated uh pitching those force here i'm healing up my force I'm going to take this other kind of Tieri, take my monks, and maybe multiple monks here because I know there's a castle over here that can probably kill my guys as they try to make the move here. Bring my kind of Tieris here, bring my monks here, try to batter down the wall. Actually, do I still have my battering ram? I think I might have... I should have paid attention. I actually don't know if I still have my battering ram. It's not. So I'm going to bring my kind of Tieri here. Slowly. Tear down this wall. Oh, look, there's quite a few units actually. I might actually need my, my forces from the south to get up here. I even try to convert a couple of these. Or excuse me, champion. Um, just in case, I'm going to bring this force here. 
Yeah, so we're saying here you can see the Spores of Hero. But if you haven't seen Spores of Hero up close, it's actually very well designed. Um, obviously not just a generic Materi. I mean, yes, I said, you know, Spores is probably mounted most of the time, probably had a lance. But really cool um, depiction here is actually a pretty true life depiction. In fact, if you actually notice this, this cap he's wearing up here, you can see all better on the icon, was actually a cap. Um, that kind of tier you wore at the time has a nice stylish cape. I mean, again, these were guys that I don't want to oversell it too much, but they were guys that were mercenaries, so they wanted to have a certain image um, to you know showcase to potential employers. So you end up seeing um, some of the behaviors were not just purely um, you know practical. They, they did want to look good. They did want to survive, and so they deck themselves out in nice armor with nice horses and really advertise themselves as being like, you know, the best mercenary you can you can buy. And it didn't matter that they could be have a contract with one faction if they're sent to go fight if you're working for Milan and you're sent to go fight Venice, Venice hears about you, they know you're a great soldier, a great leader. You know, they may be willing to pay you more and these Conateria had no problem just jumping ship and doing that. It's a pretty large force here. I probably don't need them now, but I'm gonna go ahead and try to go tear down this gate over here and drop off the relic. Still a few cavaliers. I'll probably run in before the gate is open. That's always a nice, easy tactic, but a little tricky to pull off sometimes, especially when we got, you know, the monk all the way right here. I'll bring him a little closer. And, you know, I haven't been playing optimally, actually. I should be training some more units, because it will take quite a few units to do that final push. I'm gonna kind of spare my gold for maybe training Arbalesters. So Pitchin, get Thumbring as well, get some Pikemen. So Pitchinino's military, you can see here, is, is very Italian-centric. Um, he's, he's got a lot of Cavaliers, so I'm gonna get a Pico Genoese Crossman, but I'm gonna go Pikemen just so I can save the gold cost and instead of spend the gold on getting more Condottieri and Arbalesters. Um, Condottieri to take out his hand cannoneers and Arbalesters to take out his Condottieri. Um, and slowly tearing down this wall, or this gate, and just prepare to do a mad dash here, hopefully draw away some of the castle fire. Almost there. Keep the pikemen coming. Actually, you know what, I might also get the arson technology. Introduced first in African Kingdoms, I believe. And then, we'll set up more units. And we drop off the relic as fast as we can up here in the monastery. And then I'm going to take the city of Ravina. I'll get more resources. Um, and then I'm going to make a push for the final enemy. You bring okay. such honor to our family name, Francesco. We are now strong enough to strike at Piccinino. And a couple more units here. Again, I'm being very deliberate here. I want to be kind of slow and steady. Um, I think it's a way to kind of approach this scenario. Drop off the relic. I don't actually need to drop relics anymore, so I'm going to keep it in there. Let's collect resources. And I should probably need to get some siege weapons, fortunately. I now have access to a university, which means I can get chemistry, and I can now do um, what the Italians are good at. Get some gunpowder units in here, bombard cannons. I think I'm going to primarily use bombard cannons here to defeat the enemy, I mean, to tear down their walls, destroy their buildings. Again, my objective is not to kill every Pichinero's uh, units, just to destroy his military buildings. So I'm going to go ahead and train a couple of light cavalry. I'm going to try to look and see what the enemy's position looks like. Um, again, just training some more units. Got a bunch here. I may actually want to do a two-prong attack. One thing about the AI, in Age of Empires, is sometimes they're pretty vulnerable to a uh, two-pronged attack because they respond to one, send all their units uh, rushing to, to defeat one, and then you can kind of backdoor them, which is especially useful in this case because then I can maybe destroy their buildings that I need to destroy um, with a backdoor tactic. Again, that's something that is actually modulated in the AI script. Um, there is a command line for that that can determine how, how responsive an AI is to units near them and to attacks. Um, of, of their fellow units, as well as the um, the range over which they do it. So you can actually modulate that as a uh, AI writer, a scenario designer, um, and you know control you know how responsive over how many tiles the AI will be to attacks. So for example, you can see right now, yes, they're they're having their units attacked here, but they're not sending units that they have sitting over here to go 
fight here because it is modulated by that command line. You can make it very high and literally have uh, on one side of the map an AI unit being attacked and they'll send units all the way from the other side of the map to do it. But I would say that that wouldn't make sense. And so um, usually you have a much closer range of maybe like 20 tiles or so, depending on what you want to do. I took some damage here, that's fine. I'm just gonna heal up my units. I wish I had a tower here so I can pick these guys off. I'm not worried about them shooting at the gate. Oop. Should make two separate attack groups. That's the obelisks. Obelisks against cavalry is not ideal. I really see the units. So again, if you're if you want to try this scenario on hard, um, if, if you follow if you follow the basic strategy I used here, you probably have success. Um, again, just know Pacino's uh, forces here and what will be the most logical counters for them in the Italian um, Civ. Probably don't need quite as many of these. Let me keep a couple of these. And since I have, now I can train Bombard Cannons, I'll probably train two Bombard Cannons here. Send them south, just thinking how I want to approach this in terms of grouping my forces. You know, I got kind of a random grouping because I don't know, you know, they'll send their their, their forces, you know, their Condottieri, their Cavaliers, their Hand Cannoneers, um, either one, either side, they have pretty much the same forces. So this is slightly smaller, but it does have four guns and stuff. I'm going to call this group one, have them take out the hand cannoneers here, and have this bigger group here, which doesn't actually get everybody I want. Leave one, maybe one pikeman back, monk, you're probably more valuable than the pikeman. Or let's say the obelisters, the obelisters. are stuck. Put one of the obelisters out. Bring this force down. Let's be back on my reinforcements in case I need them. Bring the bombard cannon here. I think I want to try to also train, give two more bombard, or one more bombard cannon, all I can afford. Got Malatesta leading this group here, Sigismundo Malatesta. And you got Francisco Sforza here leading the, the southern attack. I'm telling the story here. And then bring this bombard cannon here. Picking off some of the units, so they're continuously training units. So I don't want to kind of get bogged down, you know, dealing with their attacks. But I can draw some of their ones from the south defenses north, and that'll enable Sforza here to start battering down the gates. Now they, I know they do have bombard towers, so it's a little tougher here. At least they have bombard towers on. Yes, they are a So I have to bring my bombard cannon and start taking them out. Taking this path, I end up joining my forces here. These guys love that. Don't have to be so close. No, don't start taking hits from the bombard cannon. Come on, guys. The rocks falling out of the sky. The cannonballs falling out of the sky. Back up a little bit. Bombard cannon. So they're going to be pumping out units. Focusing on trying to take out my bombard cannon. Try to destroy their bombard towers. That's fine. I'm going to take them all. Since, but I want to keep enough units forward that they don't aren't able to kill my bombard cannon here. I got another bombard cannon. I'm going to move up. So you can kind of see my approach. First, start battering down the biggest threat here, which is bombard cannon, bombard tower. Use my monk to heal a bit. Now try to get the other bombard cannon out or bombard tower destroyed. This bombard cannon is here. So try to take out this tower from the outskirts. I just keep some units up here just so they can, in case they have any more stragglers up there that may kill this lone cannon. What do I pay you dogs for? Fight harder! I will not be defeated by Sforza! Ah, Pichinino's getting a little perturbed by our attack. Very deliberate approach here. After destroying this tower, I'll then destroy the gate. And then slowly start bringing my forces closer, because I know he's pumping out units, right? And then my objective is to, or my goal is to use these bombard cannons. 
and concentrating almost entirely on their military buildings. I don't, I don't care about their houses and all that stuff, their town center. I don't care about even their military units, except as far as they would uh, potentially attack my uh, bombard cannons, which is what I don't want to happen. I should probably open the back door into here. I'm not sure it would be worth it. Might be a good idea. Open the back door. Okay, let's move up a little closer. At least. Uh, send them some condos out. We're forcing my Arbalesters to make short work of them. Send them hand cannoneers, but my Conatieri and so forth will destroy them. There's a tower there. I think. Since I don't see any military buildings in range, I can focus on this while keeping my guys just far enough that we're not aggroing too many of their enemies here. That I think they have some more enemies in here. So this tower is destroyed. We can move. Okay. They have a castle, so I don't want to get too close to them. So I got the hand cannon, the bombard cannons closer. Okay, this group can march out, bring in this guy, have him take out the city workshop. These guys can take out this town. It's actually pretty easy on modder. I actually did a run through of this on hard and I'm uh, trying to talk. I actually found it pretty difficult. I, I had done like maybe seven different attacks um, doing the same strategy. Um, but I weren't very successful because I wasn't playing the optimally. Kind of um, this time, moderate is significantly easier. Um, it looks good. Whoa! Castle. I'm going to focus on that. One more cannons are. This guy can actually still do that from outside the wall. Take out this tower. Very smart hand cannon. Very, very smart hand cannon. He lured away one of my pikemen into the range of the of the castle, and then he started shooting at my bombard cannon, trying to take out the castle. So yeah, I can do some pretty some pretty smart uh, management of individual units. Honestly, probably better than even a human can. So I probably wasn't smart doing this, but at least took that guy out. Keep everything back. Still, still in pretty good shape though. I, I wish it would take a little longer now, I think, just because I've lost one of my bumper cannons. Then once that one down, try to bring the other one here to take up the castle. Um, once I get the castle, I know there's military rings here, there's a barracks I can destroy. I want to be very cautious because I don't want to lose any of my units. Or my bumper cannons specifically. So they're still training guys. I'm going to take out castle. You can see this little uh, gallows here. So I can be guided for the game. Let's get this bombard team. Let's get this bombard team here. So making pretty short work of Piccinino here. So again, what kind of happened in the story is actually what happened in, in real life. It was um, right after Piccinino, um, he was... Or I should say, right after Sforza was uh, betrothed to the Duke of Milan's daughter, um, at that point he kind of realized, you know what, the Duke just tried to, he hired me, then tried to kill me, actually imprisoned Sforza for a while as well. Um, Sforza was a smart guy, he's like, well, you know, it's, yeah, things are looking good right now, but, the, you know, the vagaries of chance, fortune may change, um, on a dime, it's, I, you know, Filippo Maria Visconti was very fickle. And so Spurs decided, hey, you know what, he's paying me to go defeat some of his enemies, but let me just take the weapons and the money he's giving me and make my own fight them. So he went to the Romagna region, um, took the city of Ancona, um, and so started creating his own little fight them, starting his own territory. Um, and obviously that pissed off uh, Filippo Maria Visconti, so he sent Piccinino out to get him. And you'll see, kind of referring theme to a scenario, that, or through this campaign that you kind of saw in the first scenario, is Piccinino is also very bold, very aggressive, very um, glory-driven man, and so he doesn't want, like the fact that Spores is now, you know, in, you know, he's like the rising sun, and so Piccinino is very glad to try to cut Spores it down a few pegs. Unfortunately, Piccinino wasn't able to do it. In this case, uh, we're defeating his military buildings. Oh, he's going to come up with some kind of thing. Don't attack him here. Destroy his barracks. Plug the bombard cannon. We'll go here. Destroy the buildings. And then we'll be able to defeat Piccinino and take control of the Armada. Which now gives Forza a power base. So if his fickle masters, his fickle employers, 
um, decide to betray him or hunt him down before he gets a chance to betray them. He now has his own power base, his own source of resources, his own source of income, his own landed estate um, that can give him a lot more leverage to be able to actually do the things he wants to do. So you start seeing a sea change in Sforza's uh, tactics. This is not approach. over, Sforza. I swear that I will hunt you down to the farthest ends of Italy. And there we go. Scenario complete. Let's look at the map real quick. I think we covered almost everywhere on the map. Um, you can see this autumn in the Italian, the northeastern Italian countryside. This would be the Adriatic Sea here. Um, cities like Ravenna and Pissarro and Rimini and Ancona. Okay. And we'll hear the rest of the story. Sforza and Piccinino were like two alley dogs fighting over a scrap of meat. They were natural rivals, precisely because they were so alike. Of the two, Sforza had a certain pedigree. If you could call being the bastard of a mercenary captain, pedigree. From his father, Sforza inherited his forbizia, cunning, and used it to get the best of his rivals, his patrons, and his women alike. Piccinino, the son of a butcher, came into the profession as a soldier. He rose through the ranks and became an advisor to a trusting, yet incompetent condottiero. In this position, Piccinino lured his captain into an ambush and took command of the company. That Sforza and Piccinino would, years later, become blood enemies was as inevitable as two dogs fighting over a single piece of meat. There you go, two dogs fighting over a single piece of meat. Sforza and Piccinino, each trying to get the contracts and be the master of Master Condottiero in Italy. Um, wrote those kind of slides there to just provide some of the background information on the two men. As you can see, um, just from their backgrounds, you can kind of learn a bit, not just about the personality of the man and what they were about, which is very different than some of our other heroes featured in the campaigns who are, you know, kings and so forth. Um, one thing about the scenarios that I've designed, I have kind of focused on commoners. I did, um, uh, did the Almeida campaigns, Forza, Bay and Yang, Ivailo, the only campaign I've done that I've designed that has um, not been someone uh, aristocratic or noble would have been the Prithviraj campaign for the definitive edition. Um, again, that kind of shows some of the commoners um, and some of the backgrounds of some of these comments here. They have very interesting lives. If you get a chance to read some of the books about these men, very interesting, very cunning men. Italy at this time was very different from the rest of feudal Europe in that a common man could actually gain power. And if he's savvy enough, smart enough, skilled in combat, he could actually rise up through the ranks. And that's something that wasn't really possible in, let's say, some other parts of uh, medieval Europe at this time, which made Italy very unique, very innovative, um, and made this really a period of a lot of change, obviously, with the Renaissance in Italy. So again, we end up having a successful um, scenario here, completed just about an hour and eight minutes on um, on standard difficulty, or excuse me, moderate difficulty, pretty straightforward scenario. Hope you enjoyed this. If you haven't checked out uh, part one, make sure you enjoy that as well. If you like this video, subscribe to the channel, like the video, and stay tuned for part three, which will be coming up pretty soon. We'll, the scenario is called Prodigal Son, and we're actually traveling now to Northern Italy and having a one-on-one -on -one showdown with Piccinino himself. So stay tuned for that one.